the interesting thing is I think there's often this idea that happiness or enlightenment or whatever you want to call it is this this thing out there over there in some other place when actually you start to realize when you kind of practice in that way that it's actually moment to moment like enlightenment happiness peace of mind is is here in this moment if we experience this moment not only now but in the next moment and the next moment and the next moment then we have stability of enlightenment of happiness of peace of mind now a lot of you recognize that voice because you listen to it every evening that's right it is the voice of headspace founder andy puttycomb and he's going to give us insights on how to achieve happiness and enlightenment in this modern world that and much, much more is ahead on today's Super U Podcast. That's one small step for man. Liftoff. We, we have a lift We choose to go to the moon, not because they are easy, but because they I are I have hard. a dream. You can't handle the truth. Seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Two. One. Super, 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 you. Thank you for joining us for today's Super You Podcast. I'm your host, Eric Quam, and a lot of you know me as Equal Man, and this is a podcast designed to unlock and unleash your superpowers on the world. And to help us do that, we have a special guest, Andy Puttycomb, and he's a former Brutus monk, and probably most of you know him as the co-founder of Headspace, which is the hugely popular meditation app. And I remember meeting Andy the first time in South by Southwest. And it's so weird to meet someone like that where you hear the voice all the time, then you finally walk up and meet that person. Uh, a lot of people do that to me as well because I read my book, The Focus Project. So they only know my voice and then all of a sudden they see you and they hear your voice. It's just a, a unique experience to say the least. Uh, but his voice is heard around the world. And he was the first introduced to meditation at the age of 10 by his mother and then he became a grounding it became a grounding force for him in his life uh at obviously at a very young age and then at 22 he really felt overwhelmed and so what did he do unlike us what do you do you're 22 you're overwhelmed some people just go on a, a gap year around the world and travel but instead he decided to travel to the himalayas and become a monk uh, so then he got ordained in the tibetan buddhist tradition and he spent the next decade you heard me right the next decade living a monastic life, uh, practicing meditation intensively up to 16 hours per day. He, he's doing this across India, Nepal, Thailand, and Russia. Then in 2004, he returned to life in the UK and his vision was to make meditation accessible to all. Uh, he met his future business partner, Rich Pearson, and together they launched Headspace in 2010. Uh, they did that as an events company before transitioning to the now famous meditation app, which at the time people were like, what? That's the last thing you'd use an app for is meditation. Are you supposed to get off your devices? Uh, but they thought differently. It's been wildly successful. It's helped so many people. Uh, and Andy it is the voice and also the face. So that's why I mentioned that I knew that voice for a long time before I first met him. Uh, and Headspace has grown to over 65 million users. Have you heard that right? 65 million users. It's almost in every country, 190 countries. And it's really, they are the pioneers, Headspace is, in the field of digital mindfulness and meditation training. And if you ever meet Andy in person, he is five foot ten. So, you know, on this show, we always want to do the height. So, without further ado, let's figure out how do we capture that joy, that happiness and enlightenment that we all search for. Now, I've given a little bit of background on your history, Doug. We'd love to hear more in your own words, your meditative journey. I was about 11 when I went along to my first meditation class. And trust me, it had all the stereotypes that you can imagine, uh, sitting cross-legged on the floor, the incense, the herbal tea, the vegetarians, the whole deal. But um, my mom was going, and I was intrigued, so I went along with her. I'd also seen a few kung fu movies, and secretly I kind of thought I might be able to learn how to fly, but I was very young <laughs> at the time, you know. Now, as I was there, you know, I guess like a lot of people, I assumed that it was just an aspirin for the mind. You get stressed, you do some meditation. I hadn't really thought that it could be sort of preventative in nature. Until I was about sort of 20, when a number of things happened in my life in quite quick succession 
really serious things which just flipped my life upside down and all of a sudden I was inundated with thoughts inundated with difficult emotions that I didn't know how to cope with every time I sort of pushed one down another one would just sort of pop back up again it was a really very stressful time I guess we all deal with stress in different ways some people will bury themselves in work grateful for the the distraction others will turn to their friends their family looking for support some people hit the bottle start taking medication my own way of dealing with it was to become a monk so I quit my degree I headed off to the Himalayas I became a monk and I started studying meditation people often ask me you know what I learned from that time well obviously it changed things you know let's face it becoming a celibate monk is going to change a number of things but it was more than that you know it it taught me it gave me a greater appreciation and understanding for the present moment by that I mean not being lost in thought not being distracted not being overwhelmed by difficult emotions but instead learning how to be in the here and now how to be mindful how to be present I think the present moment is so underrated it sounds so ordinary and yet we spend so little time in the present moment that it's anything but ordinary there was a, a research paper that came out of Harvard just recently that said on average our minds are lost in thought almost 47 percent of the time 47 percent at the same time this sort of constant mind wandering is also a direct cause of unhappiness now we're not here for that long anyway but to spend almost half of our life lost in thought and potentially quite unhappy I don't know it just me it kind of seems tragic actually especially when there's something we can do about it when there's a a positive practical achievable scientifically proven technique which allows our mind to be more healthy to be more mindful and less distracted. Now, you lived in a monastery for a decade. What was it like to live that monk lifestyle, to live in a monastery for a decade? So the experience, and for anyone thinking about, about go, taking that experience, I think, you know, there's a, there's a honeymoon phase. And if you've done any sort of retreat or anything like that, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of recognize this. When you first go there, and this was way before social media and mobile phones and everything so but even then there's a honeymoon phase where it just feels like you're away from the distraction of the world feels very peaceful feels very calm very easy and then after a week or two eh, starts getting a little more kind of challenging you realize that oh wow i just have to sit here with my thoughts and my thoughts are the same thoughts that i have back there but now i don't have any distraction now I don't have anywhere to go. There's no pub to go to. There's no friends to call up. There's, there's not even any books to kind of, you know, uh, escapist type books to, to kind of read, you know. Um, so it's quite sort of challenging. And I would say not in a, in a negative way, but that is, that is then the, the path, you know. It's kind of can we sit with the mind, not having any strong preference for how the mind behaves, but instead holding our seat with awareness getting comfortable with thoughts coming and going, not getting involved in the thoughts, not buying into them or believing that we are the thoughts. And over time, I think that space starts to kind of increase and we tend to sort of feel less overwhelmed. The mind starts to quieten down a little bit. It doesn't necessarily kind of always sort of stop, so to speak, but it slows down. And, and for me, the, the big unlock and again, I'll say this for anyone, regardless of whether you're going to go to a monastery or you're taking a 10 minute kind of meditation session. I went with the idea that I was going to stop thoughts, that I was going to end thoughts, that I was going to be free from any kind of negative emotions, somehow almost escaping the human realm. I think in my mind, that's sort of what I, I thought. And I discovered it was a very different thing, actually. It was quite the opposite. It was rather than disconnecting, it was reconnecting. Rather than unplugging, it was plugging back in. And it was actually getting in touch with thoughts and emotions that I hadn't previously recognized or addressed, getting comfortable with them to such an extent where they no longer kind of influenced um, my mind or sort of got in the way of life, allowing me to be sort of a bit more, a bit more present, I hope. 
Now, most of us in this modern world, we're always searching for happiness. We're searching for that enlightenment, but it always seems just just out of reach, just out of grasp, doesn't it? Is there any tips or anything that you've learned in your journey on how do we capture that happiness and attain that enlightenment? The interesting thing is, I think there's often this idea that happiness or enlightenment or whatever you want to call it is this this thing out there over there in some other place when actually you start to realize when you kind of practice in that way that it's actually moment to moment like enlightenment happiness peace of mind is is here in this moment if we experience this moment not only now but in the next moment and the next moment and the next moment then we have stability of enlightenment of happiness Mm. of peace of mind so if you have it 24-7 and it's moment to moment and you develop consistency and stability of that, then you always have what you always wanted and it was always here all along. The idea, again, I think the misconception sometimes is that that um, fulfillment or peace of mind or enlightenment, whatever you want to call it, is somehow somehow dull and boring, you know, um, and that maybe we experience less of life, less of our thoughts, less of our emotions. Mm. Everything's just a bit flat. But if you think about it, we're training awareness. So we're not becoming less aware of our emotions and of life and the highs and lows. We're actually becoming more aware of it. The difference is that life is no longer controlling us. We're no longer so easily overwhelmed. And we get to choose. So we see a thought that appears in... doesn't mean that we're not going to experience sad thoughts. Close friend dies, of course we're going to feel kind of devastated. But does that kind of leave us so paralyzed that we're unable to continue to live our life Mm -hmm. or are we able to see it process it and let it go you know it's interesting my girls a golf coach and my girls themselves are are wildly into orcas Uh, and orcas are known for passing down learnings from generation to generation for example they only I, i believe this is true orcas they only recently learned to hunt and kill great white sharks but now each generation knows how to do this they know how to just from birth, they know how to work as a team to turn that great white shark over and be able to attack uh, and kill that. So that great white shark is now prey and they're the apex predator of the sea because of those learnings that they pass down uh, the orcas. Now as humans, do you feel it's important for humans as well to have this knowledge transfer? I mean, we always talk about wealth transfer from generation to generation, but we don't talk enough about knowledge transfer. I'm a big believer in lineage and tradition. doesn't matter whether it's meditation or if it's in learning to play the piano or surfing, whatever it is. If something gets passed down in a very personal way over, never mind decades, but if we start talking about hundreds of years or even millennia, like something really, there's like a refinement and development that takes place, which is really powerful, I think. Mm-hmm. So I learned from my teacher who learned from their teacher, and that goes back a, a long, long way. And, and I think a big part of this is a very kind of gradual approach, right? When you come to, the, come to the app, you learn a day, and you come back the next day, and you're building on the day before. So it's, it's this step-by-step learning kind of process. Mm-hmm. I think there's something very valuable in that. In the past, back in the 80s, you buy a meditation CD or something, and you just sit there and listen to the same thing every day. Mm-hmm. So there's no real kind of development of the practice. Right, it's quite right. kind of static in a way. So I think that's one thing. I think for a lot of our listeners, meditation just seems so difficult. We know we should meditate, uh, but it's just it's just so hard just to stop thinking about whatever's on our brain. So I know <laughs> like even today, I, getting ready for this, like I got to meditate. I don't meditate every day, but I should because I know how good it is for me. I do feel better when I do it. But here I am starting to meditate. I'm trying to do my deep breath with my one word. Uh, and all I can think of is, I can't believe I missed that putt on hole 18. And so I'm thinking about, why did I miss that putt? And then should I get a new putter? And then all these thoughts, I'm like, stop thinking about your putt. Stop thinking about your putter. Uh, and so it's really difficult. I think a lot of the audience shares that as well. They got ideas that probably, oh, did I, did I buy that at the grocery store? Or what do I need to buy at the grocery store? They can't really get into that deep mindset of meditation. Um, walk us through why we should kind of give ourselves some grace when it comes to that meditation. It's not unusual for us to have those thoughts pass through and we just got to go, oh, that's an interesting thought. Let me pass that through. It's kind of like if you're about to cross the street that's quiet and all of a sudden a car passes by. You've said before, I believe, that it's really just about, oh, there's a car. That's interesting. Let that pass through. And that's the same with our thoughts. Just let them pass through and then get back to that meditative mindset. 
So you've all, I'm sure, experienced a night where you've really, really wanted to go to sleep, but you can't. So then you start thinking, okay, I need to try a bit harder. So you start trying to go to sleep. We all know how that works out. It doesn't end well. In the same way, you can't force a state of awareness, of relaxation. All we can do is set up a framework and just let the mind, give the mind space to unwind. Perhaps it sounds like this one comes from Tibet a lot more than the car one. The way they talk about it is uh, the way they, they rein in horses, wild horses, on the steeps there in Mongolia and Tibet. Rather than kind of getting the horse and trying to kind of just hop on its back, they throw out a rope and they give the horse loads and loads of space. The horse runs around, feels like it has lots of space. It doesn't feel like it's being held in any way at all or captured. But over time, they bring it in a little bit. And each time, they bring it in until the horse comes to a natural place of rest. So that's what we're doing with the mind. We're not trying to kind of pin it down and right, focus. I remember going into a bank and hearing one guy say to another guy, right, I'm going to meditate the crap out of this. OK, <laughs> that's not going to work, guys. I promise you that's not going to work. So just bringing it in gently, gently. I know a lot of our listeners, I know myself, are curious to know Historically, meditation and yoga have been very embraced by women, a lot more by women than men, historically, if you look at the data. On the Headspace platform itself, do you see that also to be true? What do you see demographically? Is it more women? Is it 50-50 split? You know, what's the demographic what do you see on Headspace on who's using the app each and every day? I think, so there is an idea, right, mm -hmm. in the past that um, traditionally women have, have gravitated more towards um, meditation and yoga and these things. Um, right from the off, mm. it has always been, been half and half on, on the platform. Mm. And when we, we do lots of focus groups and things, mm. we started asking. So the response we got from men was that, okay, typically they didn't have the social circles that their female mm. friends did. Um, and that they didn't necessarily want to go to their boss or anyone at work mm -hmm. and disclose the fact that they were necessarily struggling with stress or anxiety. <laughs> they didn't necessarily want to go and see their doctor or a therapist. Mm. The fact that they could have something on their phone that they could use in private, that they didn't need to share with anybody else, that that was a really empowering thing. Mm. So we suspect that that's part of it. But I also just think there's a broader cultural movement now. And mm. I, I would say more in the UK here than, than we see back in the US. Mm. So in terms of mental health and people being willing to just talk openly and say, actually, I'm having a hard time and that's okay. Mm. I feel like there's that, that's empowering more men to, to look at something like this. Now, in some parts of the world, especially the Western world, say New York, London, the idea of taking 10 minutes of our day to do something, basically to do nothing, uh, seems almost insane. W what are your thoughts or how has Headspace taken this head on, no pun intended, knowing that a lot of people are just going to say, I don't have 10 minutes to do nothing, to meditate? When we look at our community, and there's, there's probably, I think there's, there's over 9 million people now. And when we look at kind of how different people use it, it's really interesting. There are three very distinct groups. There are those that we call sort of vitamin type users. So it's preventative. It's kind of daily basis. Try not even to get to the point where you feel stressed and you're, you're breaking. Um, there's the aspirin users who kind of wait until they feel really stressed and then they use it to feel less stressed. And then there are people who kind of save it for life's sort of big events. I do think it's, it's quite common. Um, we live in such a, a, a sort of a, a driven society that the idea of, ta especially in New York, you know, I mean, the idea of taking 10 minutes out of our day to do nothing, I mean, it sounds obscene in New York. But if we don't, I think it's just important to remember that what are the implications? You know, not only for ourselves, but also for the people around us. So I would encourage anyone who's thinking about meditation, think about your motivation. Not only kind of about feeling calmer and clearer for yourself, but how you are to the people around you. Like, we're all the same, right? If you think, think about friends who are always kind of angry, or it, it's probably not that pleasant to kind of be around, you know? And, and the thing that we can do the one thing that we can do and have responsibility for in this world is the, the condition of our own mind, and there's a ripple effect to that. And when we're kind and compassionate to the person next to us, there's a very good chance that they will go on and do the same to the person next to them. And I think if there's enough of us in the world behaving and in that way, then there's, you know, there's extraordinary potential.
right, listeners, we know it. It's just get your mind right, get your life right. So I know it's so hard to just carve out that time to meditate and you don't have to use an app like Headspace or Calm, but just try to figure out how do you just breathe? Even if it's just taking 60 seconds just to kind of pause, just set a run in a million miles an hour. And I, I know it's easier said than done. I fall into it myself each and every day just i got way too much on the to-do list and i think i don't have time to pause but you, you do need to take those breaks you need to pause and it actually helps grow that gray matter in your brain when you do meditate so again i hope you got a lot of today's show i know i did it's always just very very fascinating uh, to sit down with these people especially those like andy that have spent so much time as a monk when you think about that just to kind of go deep into that thinking and and my hope is this helps you unlock and unleash your superpower on the world and these shows aren't made possible without the great help of jake brin so thank you jake and and also kelsey gomez for helping to put these shows together each and every day and and thank you so much to you the listener for tuning in uh thank you for all the notes that you send to equalman at equalman.com keep them coming in if you have any questions definitely that's how you reach out equalman at equalman.com and thank you to our sponsor amazon prime uh, again, if you want something delivered, sometimes same day, but definitely they can get it there the next day. Where do you go? The only place you can go is Amazon Prime. So until next time, this is your host, Equal Man, reminding all of us, it's not what we take from the world, it's what we leave behind. Seven. Six. Five. Three, two, one. Super, 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 super you.